This is The Right Approach. I'm J.W. Judge, and with me is my co-host, Barbara Hensky. It is just the two of us today as we talk about foreshadowing and using Chekhov's gun, um, which is uh, something that I did in this the last, or I guess my fifth novel, um, that I don't mind doing some spoilers because this is all authors and um, so we may get into a little bit of the specifics of that because I think there were a couple of things that I put on, put in the novel early on and knowing that I was going to use them later. Um, but before we get into that, because I was just about to launch into it, it has been a long time since we've talked about what we are working on, what's going on in our author craft and business side of things. So let's start with you, Barb. What do you got going on? So I'm now back in my happy place after six months of, um, you know, travel, some of it on filming for Guiding Emily and all the hoopla around the launch of that movie on Hallmark Channel. And then my daughter got married and my son got married, all kinds of stuff. So now I'm back to a normal bedtime and a normal get up time, which is what I love the routine. And I'm just started writing the um, fifth book in the Guiding Emily series, having done a ton of research on that. I, you know, I don't know why it surprises me that even five books in, I feel like I, there's still so much that I don't know. So I've started that, made a, a good start on that. That feels good. And um, just have kind of, I don't know, I talked to my husband about all these different things. You've got writing projects and of course you've got a full-time job. That's even more, but you've got all these these business aspects of an author career. And it's like, you've got a million windows open on your mental computer. And it's so gratifying to close some of them out and give your operating system a little bit of breathing room. So that's the happy place that I feel like I'm in right now. And, and, you know, who knows something might burst that little bubble, but I'm loving it for now. But I think you're going the opposite way. Things aren't calming for you. Tell us what's going on for you. Well, before I do that, I wanted to ask, what are the kinds of things that you're still having to research five books in to, you know, these characters and these issues? Well, you know, the, this was so startling to me. I wrote the first book with the mantra to, um, and I donate half of my proceeds, my royalties from the first book to the Foundation for Blind Children. So they were so helpful for me and were the inspiration for the book. And one of the things they said they needed was books to shine an awareness on the isolation that the visually impaired feel in the sighted community. And I said, great, I can do that in a novel. I thought I was doing that. Well, um, the Foundation for Blind Children hosted an intimate evening with author Barbara Hinsky for me in September to celebrate the Guiding Emily movie. And afterwards, it was a sold out crowd and I had half of the people in the room, there are 125 people, um, were there with guide dogs or with canes. And I'm telling you, so we were supposed to be done at seven o'clock. We got out at 10. I stood and taught people waited in line to talk to me. Visually impaired people waited in line patiently to talk to me, to tell me their stories. Cause I invited them in my speech to do that. What do you want? And so I had no idea that the isolation is even more profound. Um, yeah, well, you've got kids in school and I'm sure that you are friends with a lot of the parents of your children's best friends. That's kind of how it goes. You have this friend group, not if you're visually impaired and your sighted child is in the sighted community. People don't wanna let their kid play at your house. They don't feel it's safe. Um, Gosh, until the mid 2010s, there were states that would not allow custody to be granted to a visually impaired parent. Really? It's shocking, shocking. Um, it's hard to meet people. One guy was saying, you know, I would like to get married. And now I'm thinking, he's so nice. I'm thinking, who can I fix him up with? But people, <laughs> say, well, I don't know any other blind people. Well, he doesn't have to be a blind person. Yeah. And he said, you know, you go to, like a speed dating thing as a blind person. And you don't even know where the people are, let alone how to go up to people. And he said, people are always telling me I'm trying too hard or I'm not trying hard enough. And 
Um, I don't know. There's so many things. And I realized, okay, I've been patting myself on the back for tackling this issue for four years in four books. And I didn't even know the extent of mm. the issue. So that's been a real eye opener for me. And I'm really doubling down um, on my efforts to make inclusion really appropriate. I, I could, I don't want to rattle on it. So that's why I'm doing it. So anyway, back to you. So I have mentioned several times that really the last five months uh, since May of work has been just crazy busy. Um, and so I pushed through and finished that, you know, the rough draft of that first novel back in toward the end of June, um, did the editing in July and then um, had a couple people read it after that. And then had difficulty when I was ready to start on the next thing, figuring out what the next thing was going to be. I wrote five chapters of a fantasy novel. I wrote five chapters of this book that I have settled on. Settled's not the right word. Um, that that I have decided to write. And it... I had a short story called The Murder Tree, and this picks up like minutes after the end of that short story. And I had to decide, even within this last week, of do I incorporate that short story into the novel? Um, the short story was written in first person. It had a particular sense about it. And then there were going to be two protagonists in this novel. And it's written from a third person perspective. And so I went back and read that and looked at it and was just like, you know what? That's its own entity. I'm going to leave it alone. And we're just going to pick up here and tell the parts that need to be told, leave the rest untouched. And, you know, so I am now about 12,000 words into novel number six. And then there was another one that I wrote one chapter of a third or another fantasy novel that I really like the, I don't really have a story. I have a premise. Um, mm -hmm. And I really love the first chapter, but I've got to put some more thought into that because it's not ready to write yet. So anyway, I settled on this um, because it is a crime family drama. Um, if folks have read, Galveston by Nick Pizzolatto or Bull Mountain. It's it's set in rural Alabama in a, about crime family. Um, and so that's that's where I'm going, you know, now. And it kind of rides on the back of hoping still that I can sell the fifth book to a publisher. Um, this feels like a good book to come on its heels which is why I stayed away from the fantasy novels thinking that you know if if a publisher is going to buy the first one they're going to want to know what comes after it and this makes more business sense um yeah absolutely yeah and so that's the why um but even once I decided on it and started writing it my work just has really interfered. And so for the last few months, mostly the time that I would spend from, you know, 5.30 to 6.30 writing has been just getting up and logging into work to make sure I can get everything done. And I, over the weekend, looked back at October thinking, I will be surprised if I got more than 4,000 words done in October, just because I'm looking at most of the days have zeros in my word count spreadsheet. And some of them are a hundred here or a couple hundred there with, I mean, only one day that I had over a thousand words and then a couple other days that had in the high hundreds and that's it. And so, but it was still came out to 6,900 words, which is, you know, it's not great, but it's, it's more than I expected. Um, it's good enough to keep moving this thing forward. Absolutely. You should be so proud of that because so many people 
don't challenge themselves to do what they can in difficult circumstances. They just put it aside and you know how that goes. You put something aside and it it grows roots where it is and it never moves. Um, and what a smart business move to say, no, if I'm looking for a publisher for this and they want a two book deal or want more, they're not gonna want a fantasy novel for my, yeah, for your watch party novel. So I think that is so, so smart. I sort of see, you know, you keep, I, we've talked about this murder tree thing. I'm just fascinated by this. I sort of see a, a series like Justified. Did you ever watch Justified? Yes, it is very much in the vein of Justified. And, you know, there some of these yeah. counties in rural Alabama that are, there was not, at least as far as Eastern Kentucky is portrayed, there is not just a whole lot of difference between um, Northwestern Alabama and Eastern Kentucky and the poverty and, you know, the mm -hmm. opioid e epidemics and where they used to have mining and the mining is coal mining specifically and mining has changed from digging in the ground to strip mining or it's gone entirely and so yeah there are a lot of similarities and i have in fact in the last few months i've gone back and watched the second and third season of justified and um you know those families and those dynamics and uh, there's definitely parallels there I, I bet that we should go back and watch that because we're running out of stuff now. Um, and that was, I thought the writing was just brilliant and the characterization was just brilliant on that. A um, lot to be learned from watching TV. Yeah. And I'm not going to claim to be Elmore Leonard, but uh, if I could be half of that, then that would be happy, happy occurrence for me. Happy times. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about our topic. Um because used to be when I was a reader, before I was a writer, you would see, you know, once you finish a novel, you would see all the things that were leading you to the inevitable, but still surprising conclusion. Um, and you'd be like, how, do, how are authors that smart? <laughs> and uh, sometimes it's, they are, but other times it's, they didn't have to do it in the order that you read it because they could go back and do it. But I know that you have written romance, you've written women's fiction, or maybe it's women's fiction, not specifically romance. Um, and you've also written mystery novels. So, you know, when you're looking at foreshadowing things to come, do you have a particular approach? I wish I did. I certainly don't. The thrillers, you know, the kind of things you write, um, and, and I wrote two of them. Yeah, foreshadowing there really has to be finely crafted. And you can build in some things going along, but that's a lot of that is backfilled because it has to be accurate. You can't um, mislead. Your red herrings can't be purposely misleading. I think, you know, I've read some things recently where I'm like, oh, come on. When it ended up, I'm like, oh, please. Mm -hmm. You know, that this is a dirty pool because you really um, not just misled us, but you you lied to us. Mm. So a sleight of hand is one thing, but lying to the reader as an author is a whole different thing. Um, and, you know, in romances, you do do some foreshadowing of what's to come um those tropes are usually so well ingrained everybody knows you know enemies to lovers and you know all that kind of stuff in the right book of the fifth emily i'm writing now i am trying to foreshadow just started it i'm like ten thousand words in i'm trying to foreshadow the real discrimination that pregnant women who are blind face even to this day Mm. Uh, I'm telling you, I am shocked. So I'm trying to foreshadow some of that. And um, my editor, I just read an email before we got online. She said, no, it's too, too subtle. You're going to have to be, I know what you're going for, but the reader isn't. So I, I want to think about that. I'm not sure she's right because as a blind person, this is 
very intimately experienced by you as the blind person. If people are being disapproving of you and thinking, oh, you can't take care of your baby, which is nonsense. But I want the reader to experience it as the blind person does. And they may not pick up on some of these subtle cues or do they? And, you know, how sensitive are you to this environment that you perceive differently than people who are sighted? Um, so I'm just, I'm thinking about it, but foreshadowing, I think doing it right is the, is the hardest bit of technical writing construction. What do you think? Yeah, it's tough. And, you know, you were talking about discrimination and I was thinking, I was thinking about this just the other day, um, is that, you know, it used to be that just, and, and in some ways it still is. So <laughs> don't judge the first part of the statement without hearing all of it, that discrimination, whether it's, you know, disability or gender race was so overt that it couldn't be missed and yes. it was intentional. Um, yes. and we have, we have take, not taken care of, uh, you know, to say it's that kind of discrimination is eradicated would be a foolishness, but at least on the surface, so much of that has been litigated and take, you know, attended yeah. to in recent years, but there is still this subversive, insidious, mm -hmm. subtle yeah. discrimination and, you know, like it's super easy for me as a white male to be able to say that, right? Um, because I'm not the subject of any of it. Um, but it's so much more difficult to pinpoint. Um, and, you know, you were talking about readers. Are they going to pick up on the subtleties of the discrimination that the character is experiencing or the, mm -hmm. the actual visual impaired person is? Um, and it's so much harder now even you know even to identify in my own prejudices and to monitor and be aware of that and you know am I treating people differently mm -hmm. um whether it's unintentional and you know all of that is it's harder now to to identify that and so I think that's really interesting to see you tackling that issue and also trying to figure out what's the best way to deal with it yeah, I that's you're exactly right. The insidiousness of discrimination in most in the context of most of our daily lives makes it a little harder. And I feel like for the visually impaired blind woman, it's kind of death by a thousand cuts. Um, and how do you portray that without you just don't have time to really get into that in a novel, but you need to give a sense of it. So um that's what I'm gonna try and you know I think you may be a white you are a white male but now you're subject to people doubting you know the whole own voices movement now, I, I find that too with writing about uh visually impaired people because although I have I I probably would be called low eyesight maybe but I'm nowhere near being visually impaired and so can we really legitimately say something and about it? And I think we can. I mean, you can write about a serial killer without being a serial killer. You have to. So I think we all just have to be able to tap into that and not get discounted just because we are not um, in whatever this focus group is. Yeah. It's, a, it's complex now. It sure is. Yeah. Um, but you know, back to your question about foreshadowing, I'll give some really specific examples. So in Watch Party, the, the fifth novel, um, which you read, it's, you know. And you did I a think, masterful job. I well, never, felt, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Um, is, you know, this group of people is on a private plane on their way back from South America to Alabama. They are part of a coal mining company. As, I guess coal mining is, is running a theme lately. Um, and they run into a storm and crash on this remote island in the Caribbean. Um, and some things I, you know, it's told from the a first person female perspective. Um, and some of, you know, what we have is about 10 days in, things take a turn. People give up hope 
and then you have the first body disappear um, with, with evidence of what is likely a murder. And I, nobody knows there's, there's a pool of blood and nobody. Um, and so our protagonist decides that she needs to be able to take care of herself. And one of the guys does jujitsu. And so, you know, I put it in there that they start taking lessons and I felt like, like he's teaching her some stuff that is to me very obvious that this is going to come into play at some point down the line, because you're not going to have a character do that. And it never have any effect on the story. Um, but another thing that I did intentionally, not knowing how I was going to use it, but knowing that I was going to use it was that, you know, they're on this Island. It's tropical. There's coconuts. We watch Survivor at our house um, and have learned that coconuts are difficult to open. Um, and so, you know, I had them when they made their camp to put this stake in the ground that they could use to like to slam the coconuts down on and crack them open and that sort of thing, knowing that somebody's death along the way is going, this is going to be involved. And I didn't want to draw too much attention to it. I just oh, wanted didn't. like... Like here's this implement and it exists. It's a useful tool for them in camp and it's going to have a function later on. And I didn't know how I was using it, how I would use it. I had some ideas and then at some point it, you know, concreted itself. And then I knew what I was going to do with it. Um, but I wanted to make sure that like I had put that in place and there was reference to it so that I could use it later. Yeah. And you did. I, I never felt like anything was, all of a sudden manufactured to, you know, get, get a resolution. Yeah. Everybody's like, Oh yeah. Yeah. And you know, in my initial trilogies too, I had these magic systems cause they were fantasy and they were not like super in depth, like some of these, um, you know, epic fantasy that have very hard magic systems that there's lots of rules and yeah. that isn't something I wanted to focus on. Um, I just wanted enough in place that you could figure it out. Um, and they were fairly rudimentary. And, but one of the things I had to do throughout was make sure I was consistent about so that I didn't have somebody doing something in book three that wouldn't have been allowed under the rules that were established in books one or two. And so, you know, just that consistency too, with, with rules that you create for your world. And do you keep track of those? Do you have, a, I, mean, <laughs> I have to even keep track of the names of my characters and their pets and their relationships. Do you keep track of those sorts of rules? No. Um, because they were, they were not complicated. They were consistent. Okay. I didn't put a great deal of, because even though they were fantasy novels, the magic wasn't, Yeah, it was more supplemental, I felt like, than, like, I probably could have written those as, well, I mean, the first one, I think I probably could have written as just a straight kidnapping story. It mm -hmm. got a little more, and the second one was a serial killer novel. You could have written that straight. Um, the third one, definitely not, but um so it was more a supplemental kind of thing and it was involved and it was an important part of the story, but it wasn't the whole story. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, far, but, I was just going to say in my Rosemont series, my first series, which is women's fiction with mystery, thriller, suspense. And there's a shady before when it opens, this woman's the protagonist who's 55 and a, forensic accountant her husband who is a college president has died and of a heart attack so no suspicious circumstances but he was real shady he had been embezzling from his employer and he had a second family somewhere else so he just had all kinds of shady stuff going on so as the books have gone along and in my ninth book um when I need like some something to go wrong for Maggie and something for her to work on I can always bring back some shady little thing that you know surfaces from Paul's mm. past and that's what I've done um for the next book and 
that I'm going to start writing next year, the 10th book will. So sometimes those little things that you start off with, you don't realize are indeed the gift that keeps on giving you and keep running it up. Yeah. Well, and I'm, I think the same thing or something similar was true for me and watch party that will be similar tr here is that when you're developing, you know, foreshadowing isn't all objects. Um, it's also characters and what are, you know, things you can put in, you know, cause I know that you have crime involved in your Rosemont series, um, mm -hmm. you know, white collar level crime. And so would you, you know, you've just alluded to, and mine is more um, overt with these, with the crime novels and the murder mystery, and, but you want enough behaviors. And so particularly with the murder mystery, you want enough behaviors in your characters and enough personality that it's plausible that you don't know who is doing the killing or who's doing what, because you have hinted to enough things without being misleading, or there's just been enough bad behavior by one person that you're like, well, if they're capable of that, what else are they capable of? Um, and so just fully forming those characters in a way that sheds color and light on the story, but also keeps people like, you know, you were mentioning the husband who who's dead now, but his past keeps, keeps giving you things um, for your stories. It's like bring having that, that roundness about those characters gives you more that you can write about and more places you can take the story like a chapter i wrote most of on uh i don't it was one day this weekend i don't remember if it was saturday or sunday now um was this my protagonist is going to meet with somebody to find out if there is another assassination assignment that they've received or not because they're family of hitmen um and it turns out that this person is her aunt and she's this like super colorful, you know, lively, vivacious uh, person who's just also uh, involved in this world. And I had no idea. I didn't know when I started writing the scene that it was going to be her aunt. I just knew that it was this okay, in particular to, a woman. Supposed to kill her aunt? No, no. The aunt is giving her the assignment. Oh, the um, aunt. Oh, oof. But... And I didn't know it was going to be her aunt. I didn't know how the conversation was going to go, but I knew, you know, and so it just kind of took on a life of its own, which is one of my favorite things about writing. It's like getting into a scene, like I had no idea what was about to happen here. Um, and then it happened. And so we're going to go from there. But, you know, there was enough from my main character that I knew about her and enough, not just this crime aspect of her, um, but all of the other aspects of her personality that I've developed that her interaction with this other person that was, you know, totally made up on the spot has life to it. Wow. That is so interesting. I can't wait to read this. So do the people that get assignments to murder somebody, do they ever like use discretion and say, no, that person doesn't need to be dead. I like that person. So there is. This novel set in Walker County. You can go look this up when we're done. There are, there's been 60 minutes pieces. There are news stories about in Walker County, Alabama, like you can't throw a rock without finding somebody who's willing to be a hitman is the legend of, and you used to could do it fairly inexpensively. Um, and so, you know, I have just built like, this is a family and this is like, you know, you have certain crime families and some are involved in drugs and some are involved in prostitution and for them, this is their thing. Um, and so, you know, it's, I, I think that I haven't specifically taken that head on of your question about, is there discretion in it? Mm -hmm. um, I anticipate having to wrangle with that at some point. Yeah. But Great I think, answer. yeah. Because you want the, like you can have a protagonist who is involved in this as long as they have a code. You know, we talked about Justified. You have Raylan yeah. Gibbons, you know, for people who have watched Luther, you have Idris Elba. You have these people who have a code 
And as long as they're operating by their particular set of morals, if that's even the right word, um, then people like, like there, you've established rules and people can live with that knowing that whatever they're doing fits within the context of, and so we do need to wrangle um, with that because if she's just out there killing innocents, that's going to be a hard sell. Whereas if it's people that are involved in this life and kind of have it coming, when I say that, like totally within the fictional world, not justifying, you know, whatever, um, then I think people will say, okay, I'm willing to, you know, set aside my or suspend my disbelief and yeah. and go with it for the for the sake of the story and so yeah i have that's something i'm going to have to flesh out that she's just not out there killing whoever it's got to be folks who are i want her to parcel of the system where the people want to have the other person killed so she's mm -hmm. got the request i want you to do that too all right. If we end up with the series here, I may have to tussle with that too. With that too. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, I am hopeful. I have to do some travel in the next little bit. And I am hopeful that while in airports and on airplanes, I'm going to be able to get some writing done. Although I'm always super self-conscious about writing on a plane. Not that anybody's actually paying attention. Um, but I bought one of those screens to across the front of my laptop so that if you're at an angle at all, you can't see what I'm working on. Um, so that will hopefully, you know, take that out of my head and I can get that done. Uh, maybe we'll see even more pro productivity in November than October. We'll see. Um, yeah. And maybe you'll be able to, yeah, make some progress on uh, guiding Emily number five. Yep, I'm, I'm doing it. Hell or high right. water. All right, All right, everybody. Take care. All right. Thanks. Bye. Thanks.